media coverage in New Brunswick. <laughs> and uh, six years ago, I had the opportunity to start the show um, with the resources available, which weren't much. And Charlie Rose at the time was sort of visible um, through PBS. So you can find a round table. The round table is very important, by the way, because we're all equal when you sit in a circle. Um, and a black backdrop and a couple of cameras and away you go. Such a privilege over the past six years to have so many conversations on so many topics and give the space for those speakers to share their thoughts, their brain power, and their heart. And it's coming through collectively. If you can take the time, because an hour is a long time for a show, but if you take the time and see the smattering of all the topics from food to media to healthcare to cannabis to take your pick. It, so what I've tried to put together is um, a smattering of headlines. I'm going to bomb you for a minute. And then much like Sue, offer up a potential <coughs> strategy or suggestions um, for where you can move through what feels like all this pressure from all these different topics. Um, I count on people's support for the show. Uh, my main supporter is my wife, Betsy Griswold, um, because I've been able to carry on for the six years. So if you feel like the work is valuable, and you can go to dentistreport.ca and uh, support the show that way and share it. End of commercial. <laughs> the back of the room, where'd Jared go? So Jared Durrell's over here. He is a student intern with journalism with St. Thomas University. The internship program that he is in pays him to be an intern, which is awesome because a lot of the times the programs don't. So glad to have Jared as part of the program. You'll be seeing his work on the show in the near future. He's been working on some interesting things. So, ready to start? Okay, we call this a headline hurricane. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of headlines in a hurry, and hopefully you'll feel your stomach clench and go, oh my goodness, how do we cope with all this? Okay, this also represents a bit of your conversation on the previous two topics. This is the way we've always done something. One of the challenges in front of all of us is how do we not always do it the same way? It's moving into the unknown, and that's an exciting time if you're in for that challenge. Okay, boom. So you'd recognize this, I'm sure, and your favorite reporter, Jacques Portras, right? Because Jacques is always so kind to you guys, you know. <laughs> um, and the fact that they brought up that phrase, the not in my backyard stuff, was quite stunning. Could I go to the next one, please? Meanwhile, this is what Chris is quoted as saying, assuming it's accurate, that, you know, we're not going to infringe on another um, jurisdiction's decision on what they want for their area. Next one, please. But how quickly that slides into social media. And Caroline, some of you know, I suspect, but look at the second, the first comment. They say, I'm afraid that PA and B uh, is not take, not in my backyard stance on spraying, because their passion was the uh, stop spraying in New Brunswick stuff. So how quickly a media person frames something in a certain way and it trickles into another topic, and next thing you know, that's what they're saying about everything. Okay, next one, please. Good, meanwhile, back in Sussex, a different reporter, Sussex, the person they found anyway, said no one's asked us yet. So you got a conundrum before you even start on a major topic, which is natural resources, mineral rights, mining rights, all that stuff, and we can't even get clarity th through our media this way. It's, it's a jumble, okay? Meanwhile, as an example from the past, 2009 was the MB Power Not For Sales stuff. Stuart Jameson, MLA, Funday St. John, said no, he's not gonna support it. Stuart says, <clears throat> after speaking to a lot of people, family, friends, church members, they felt that there should be an ability for them to represent themselves in this decision, and they just felt that point of view needed to be represented with a government. Now, how is that different from what Mr. Desaunier, Ms. Conroy, and what Chris has done? But how did the media frame it differently, right? Next one, please. And of course, they continue on with the, uh, I love the subtitle on this one, because it points to a future direction. Alliance have shown a pattern of challenging Tories only to cooperate in the end. It's almost like a slur. And heaven forbid you've got a four-way minority government for the first time in a hundred some odd years, and you're trying to eke out how do we cooperate on stuff. 
Okay? And yet that's the very direction that I'll suggest at the end that you'll need to go. Next slide, please. Different topic, the plastic ban stuff. So Dieppe is looking at um, banning plastic. Next slide, please. Ottawa last week announced that they're going to come up with a plastic strategy by 2021, I think it is. Next topic, please. Meanwhile, in the science community, they'll show you that conventional plastic is still the best for the environment. Next slide, please. <laughs> See? Meanwhile, in BC, they've been having this debate for a while, and this is an opinion piece out of a, a smaller paper. But um, can you go to the next one? Councils are embracing the Victoria model where minimum price is imposed on paper bags instead of the dreaded plastic. So that sounds just like Dieppe, okay? We're gonna impose a price, we're gonna get rid of plastic, we're gonna replace it with paper. Retailers will start charging you 15 cents a bag. Well, retailers love that because it's a government imposed revenue stream, charging 15 cents a bag. Meanwhile, science shows that a paper bag production is more greenhouse gas intensive than plastic. Next slide, please. All right, then there's the Danish study that showed you have to use a cotton or a cloth bag 7,000 times before it reaches the same carbon footprint as a plastic bag that you bring your groceries home in, you put in the, you use for garbage, and then you incinerate it when you dispose it. So I'm mapping out, can you see the conflict and the muddle and the kerfuffle that's kind of going on? What do you believe in? What do you trust? Next one, please. Food supply. Have any, any of you caught what's going on in China the past two, three weeks? They've got a massive problem with their pig supply. And it's going to affect the entire world. Next slide, please. By the end of the year, China may lose as many as 200 million pigs. Another story I read is like 40% of the world's uh, pork supply. Pushing up pork prices and causing reverberations, global economy, etc. Um, squirrel moment, you know when you walk the dog and you see a squirrel and you're off in a new direction? So excuse me when I go squirrel moment because there was another story um, recently about consumer price index in Canada and it's gone up 2.7% I believe it is. One of the main drivers was the cost of food. This will come full circle as we go through the slideshow. Alberta, brutal year is the headline from the Calgary Herald. Next slide please. According to data released by Stats Canada, this is a story from just last week. Farmers in the province net income fell by 68%. A story from 2015 with Ted Wiggins. Does anybody here know Ted by any chance? He used to be the president of the National Farmers Union in New Brunswick. My interview with Ted and Amanda Wildeman from four years ago um, piggybacked on this story. So Ted is explaining that we see a lot of empty farmland. We've gone from 3 million acres to just under a million acres. It's an underutilized resource. Squirrel moment. A friend of mine once taught me 15 years ago, New Brunswick is built on three Fs, forestry, fishing, and farming. Forestry and fishing get a lot of attention. For some reason, farming just doesn't have the same oomph or bite. But we better get to it because, the next slide please, we don't have the capacity to feed ourselves. We import about 95% of our food. So weave those things together. China's got a problem with a disease. It's going to affect the entire world. Alberta's got a problem because, one, they couldn't get their product to uh, market because of oil coming through on rail, and two, because of drought. Meanwhile, New Brunswick sits, can't get the topic of food and farming on the front burner politically so that it becomes a cultural shift and we're underutilizing something that's just sitting there waiting for us when we're importing 95% of our food. Good frowns, this is good. <laughs> this story last week, did anyone ever see this? Did you see this photo somewhere? So Greenland, they've got all that heat going on. It was 40 degrees hotter than normal. Can you imagine? This expedition was heading out to go do their regular scientific study. They're only in about this much water, but Water's not supposed to be there. Water finds little cracks in the ice and it goes down and a whole other thing happens underneath. Next slide. I don't know if you can see it, but the white represents where the snow currently is or the ice currently is. The orange shows what's melted just this year. And the gray is where it's all supposed to be. And that's happening now instead of in midsummer. Meanwhile, in Newfoundland, 
tourism on iceberg watching is going through the roof. And the media reported it as a happy story. This is a good story. Now, Greenland isn't the source of the icebergs, but it's all from the same geographical area where ice shelves are breaking up and it's coming down. There was a story in 2012, um, an environmental story that said um, largest chunks of ice shelf ever were breaking off of parts just off of uh, Baffin Island, if I've got that right. And business story was showing how all the icebergs were screwing up all the shipping lanes and slowing down all the traffic. So they never connected that it was a dangerous thing to have all the icebergs, not just for the shipping lanes, but overall. And we're showing the conflict in the, how the media reports stuff. New York City, just uh, this is from March, um, $10 billion plan to build extra infrastructure to mitigate against climate change. The main body in the story, they want to do a five mile concrete wall, not between Mexico and the United States. <laughs> I was hanging right there, I have to say. <laughs> but, but interesting to note, let's fix the symptoms instead of get at the root of something. But the money's there, or the push for the money will be there. A story from um, a Cape Cod newspaper um, this week, conserva conservative estimate or nationwide for the United States is $400 billion just to mitigate climate change, raising roads up, moving buildings around, all of that. Back in New Brunswick, here's just a smattering of issues in that same stew of public conversation and how do, we, how do we find consensus and how do we build a community when all this kerfuffle is going on. Media like to do negative stories or divide stories, you know? So duality, can we go back, sorry? So duality versus bilingualism. Um, in complement to what um, Sue, Sue talked about, I have a new show coming up soon with Jane Sherrard, who is, uh, has a very clear idea on how to improve our education system. It almost echoes much what you said, and it gets into a bilingual education system where you teach all the core languages in your mother tongue, and you have a bilingual component as a three-unit day. And it'd be fun for you to kind of watch that because she studied um, over in Finland and some other places where they do this successfully. So you can get rid of a dual system. You can have a bilingual system. You can just stay in English, or you can just stay in French, or you can take the other one. And it resolves an awful lot of our issues. We have to let go of how we've done it. What are we gonna do with fracking and green energy jobs when you've got media reporting what they did on Not In My Backyard and no one talked to us? The debt and deficit is another one. Any one of these topics invites you into conflict. The hard part is, how do you live, let go of that space that you feel in your gut about, oh, I gotta fight in order to win this debate and find another way of resolving those things? Amalgamation, that one fascinates me. Do you guys remember Lise Ouellette and the other gentleman when they did their study some 10, 12 years ago on amalgamation for New Brunswick? 350 some odd local political entities and so province of 750,000 people and 350 different political governance structures. And yet, two summers ago, Sussex Corner voted not to amalgamate with Sussex. St. John, Rossé, Chris Pemsis are talking again about it, along with uh, Grand Bay and Westfield, Fredericton, Oromocto, Maryland, New Maryland. How do we get over that hump that this is the way it's always been, and yet we can't sustain 350 local governance structures. We have to figure out how amalgamation might work. Can you feel that tension? Like, ah, uh, you know? Um, healthcare costs, my interview with Joe McGarry uh, three years ago, lovely stuff, and at one point I asked him, and it was a little flip, but any answered, which was nice. So what if people just started being healthier? The, the shortest route to reducing healthcare costs and pressure on government is if citizens just started to become healthier. That also ties to food and farm production, by the way. Um, education, you've already beat on a bit. Economy, maybe a different economy can emerge. And recycling, my interview with Pat McCarthy, um, former CEO of Recycle New Brunswick. And Pat was saying there's an opportunity to put a large recycling depot just outside Sussex that's fed by St. John area, Moncton area and Fredericton area, create 300 jobs, create formal products that could go to export using our port, and he can't get any political traction to do it. 
And that's an interview three years ago. And yet you'll see all kinds of news stories about plastics in the ocean. And somewhere there's got to be some social entrepreneurs and some IT types to know how to tweak production so that it really does kick in. Uh, Carl Duvenborden was one of your guests last year. My interview with Carl and Peter Corbin. Carl says, I meet all these backyard geniuses, all these backroom geniuses, these people who invent stuff and they can't get it to market. Okay, next slide, I'm ready. So, what can we do? Politics. I accepted a long time ago that everything intersects at politics. But in my head is a different feeling for what that means. It's not the way you've kind of always seen it. Um, or about I'm in, I'm in power. There's a shift from being in power to being in governance. And that's a total different feeling. So I'm offering some suggestions about how to build a path towards that, much like Sue's eight ideas to flow out. Um, love this quote. I use it as often as I can. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. And we've just mapped out some of the tensions in the existing reality. To change something, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's what you're speaking to a little bit in education, recycling, the economy, food production, and politics. From last year to this time, you guys represent a huge step that New Brunswick's never done before in having three members in the legislature, along with the Green Party having three. We've never seen it before. Media is doing the best they can to put it back in the old box. No, no, it has to be us and them. It has to be purple and blue against red and green. The more you can dig at, no, no, this is a different model now, they will learn to catch up, hopefully. And if not, then just support the show and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was unexpected. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. So there was a new story in the Globe and Mail last week. Uh, Nick Nanos did a poll, uh, squirrel moment. I'm not a fan of pollsters. I have a sociology background. I understand some degree of statistics and how you can move numbers around in order to support your conclusion. And how to say things like uh, plus or minus 5% uh, degree of confidence. That said, regardless of it being polled, but an interesting thought, in the coming federal election, 73% of people are gonna be looking at government ethics as deciding their vote. I want to slide ethics into a feeling of trust. I want to nudge it a bit from ethics, and you think of formal process, to something in my gut says, I can trust you, I will vote for you. Flip it the other way, um, ages ago, there was other polls done about the least trusted professions, and politicians beat out car used car dealers uh, about 20 years ago, if you remember that stuff. But that really hurts our social fabric. And it's, if it's taken as an honest or a face value thing, um, then that's where we need to go, right into that. So a main driver of the next federal election might be the issue of trust. That easily spills into what's going on in New Brunswick with its new political model with four parties in the legislature. Please. There. Thanks. Next one. New Zealand's already ahead of us. They've created a new budget. This story is, I can't see the date. It was about within the past two weeks. So they're coming up with a budget, talk about economy, and the cut line underneath is the key. Country claims to be the first to measure success by people's well-being. When you focus on well-being, it integrates all the other things that we listed and all the confusion at the front end of this presentation. But we have to let go of how we always talked about the economy. Kate, okay, next one, please. McLean's, heaven forbid, comes up with this story just this past week about the need for human kindness as the solution. It's going to be an emotional connection that gets us through the shifts that we need to do, whether it's education, health care, economy. Okay. But I still don't forgive McLean's for writing this story three years ago. Um, that New Brunswick's broken. It was one of the most negative pieces out of a national publication that I've ever seen. I also had the fortune of interviewing Greg Hemmings shortly after this came out. Greg is the last person interviewed in this story. And he was ticked. And he said when this got out, he phoned the writer of the story, Martin Patrickwin, to say, what are you doing with the photo? 
because that's up at King Square. Um, the old theater was being refurbished by UNB, I believe, and they cropped the photo to take anything pretty out of it, because just behind them, there's all the flowers in bloom, and King Square looks awesome, right? Greg ex explained to me that when he phoned the writer, the writer was told by the editor, no, no, we want a negative story on New Brunswick. And so they worked the negative angle in the story. So nice that McLean's pointed to the need for kindness, but part of me still wants to watch what they're doing and how they're doing it. So to get through what's to come, maybe some simple principles instead of all this content and detail, just some simple principles to see if that helps get the shift happening in New Brunswick that you guys represent. There is no us and them. We have to get rid of that, in my view. It's just us, okay? Does that kind of resonate? You know, because you guys are always being pushed into you're over there or you're us or you're the newcomers. You got more votes than the Green Party did out of the gate. It's not us and them, it's us. The more you deliver that message, the more it'll start to resonate. Ah, squirrel moment. Um, next election, uh, there's some 300,000 people who don't vote, 270,000, something like that. My interviewer, Jean Claude Basque, he explained those living below the poverty line, roughly 100,000. They're so disenfranchised that it takes so much to get them in to vote. If you can help get the turnout numbers up to 70 or 75% from where we sit at 60 or 62, that'll be another huge shift. It gets into it's not us and them because you're doing governance instead of being in power. Next slide, please. Money is meant to flow, not to be stored only. One of the bigger problems we have is one of equity. One of the challenges with our inequity system, the 1%, the 99%, the 0.01% that you hear about, is that money's being stored too much. There's a great book called Present Shock by Lakoff. No, not Lakoff, Rushkoff. And he gives a great dissertation in two pages about how money is supposed to work. And in the past 30 years, too much of it's being stored, and you can all think of where it's all being stored and how, and how much is not in flow. And then to tweak that a little bit, it isn't just about money, but it's about economy. You can create economies without money. It's about an exchange thing, which gets to your local economy and your local exchanges, permaculture, those sorts of things. Always, always build community. And you've mentioned it from time to time already from what I've heard. So if everything nurtures community and community well-being, that'll nurture more of the political shift necessary. And if you do it all with kindness, can you imagine a headline that says politics of kindness or politics of cooperation, much like New Zealand, where they want to do an economy based on everybody's well-being? Can New Brunswick do that with a four-way political dynamic in our legislature? So back to Buckminster Fuller, he says, build a new model. And I'm trying to tease you into seeing what this new model's characteristics might have and here's some methodologies that might help you get there. <coughs> Open space forums. I've been a big fan of these. I've done several of them. Um, to give you an example, put 300 people in a room and you have no idea what you're going to talk about. But everybody in the room's got something they're passionate about. Within 20 minutes, your whole agenda is on the wall. And for the next day or two, everybody's talking about what's important to them. And as you nurture that through the day, or through the second day, you build themes. And then everybody's sitting in bigger circles talking about those themes. And it creates concrete strategies that then a government could go and implement. When you talk about bottom up, that's a process that allows you bottom up. It taps into the collective brain power and heart that's in that room because the answer is between you all. Squirrel moment. You were talking about changes in education. I had the pleasure of facilitating an open space forum for literacy in New Brunswick three years ago. It was a one day event, 120 people. It was at uh, the old St. Thomas, the old Keddies, the St. Thomas Room um, Convention Center over on the top of the hill. 120 people. You had educators, you had civil servants, you had teachers, you had um, daycare people, you had academics to do the studies. They had never met each other before. I let it go for the first half hour, totally unstructured, because they were having so much fun just meeting each other. All part of the same system, but had never met each other. So I know you from that email. Oh, I seen your name on those policy documents, right? 
much fun. Uh, to give you another sense of how it is, when doing one in Fredericton, um, pitching the city council for money, I said, uh, well, what do you want 15 grand for, Dennis? Well, I want to put 300 people in a room about how to make Fredericton better. Well, what are you going to talk about? No, I have no idea. It's up to them. It's their agenda. They'll create it. Um, what are the outcomes going to be? I have no idea. At the end of the two days, 300 people created an agenda of 55 different items with 55 agenda items with 75 concrete outcomes of which only half required more money or required money. What they found was convergence by being in the room together. So think of that, 300 people, 55 agenda items, 75 concrete outcomes done in roughly 12 hours over two days. Now flip that. I'm going to come to you in advance and say, I've got 55 agenda items. I'm going to give you 12 hours to get through them all, and I need 75 outcomes at least. You will contract. You will go, I'm not going to that meeting. <laughs> it's like, no way. So it's to illustrate how an open space forum is a large-scale consensus decision-making process that can be applied to political exercise. Next slide. Telephone town halls, big fan of these things. Um, Rex Murphy used to host Cross Canada Checkup. Uh, you phone in, ask questions, issue of the day. Does that sound familiar for some of you? Yeah? <coughs> Same thing. We now have the technology to call 50,000 people. City of Fredericton could easily be consulting with the entire population on all the major projects they have going on by doing a telephone town hall. You don't have to get up and go to a meeting. You just get the call in your house. You listen for the hour, for 10 minutes, whatever you want to do. You do a script. You take questions, just like Cross Canada Checkup. You can do some simple polling, one for yes, two for no, do you like this method, that sort of thing. And you get metrics after, and you get an MP3 after that you can throw on your website. Huge outreach program for getting hold of people in their home on how to do this sort of thing. That too changes politics. How many times have you gone to a government meeting on the budget or even MB Power and they do a consultation? And yet you're already thinking, they just want me in the room so they can say they talked to 50 or 60 people and they've already decided what they want to do. Both of these, the Open Space Forum and the Telephone Town Hall are examples of grassroots democracy, basically, grassroots communication. Next one, please. Ha, my favorite. Bold step. No mainstream media. Can you imagine Chris or Michelle or Rick not talking to the media? Other than to say, go check our website or go check our Facebook page. You literally control that message. Um, if any of you follow American football at all, there's a coach for the New England Patriots named Bill Belichick. He's famous for giving bad interviews. And there was one where the team had been particularly bad. They had had a tough game and uh, it was on the Cincinnati. So if you Google searched on the Cincinnati, you'll see Bill Belichick going on the Cincinnati, meaning the next game, the next game. He knows how to control the message, but also not give in to what the media's needs were for the divide and conquer. You guys are so far ahead of the game on your social media, which had a large role in your, in your last election. What would it be like to just say, no, we're not talking to mainstream media. All of it is now sourced directly to the citizens, much like open space forum and much like telephone town halls. You still say something, but you know, be fun. You have to develop a relationship with First Nations and complete that circle, like one of those commentaries they did, because it, it's time now. It needs to go full circle and full into the loop. And it's not like Brian Gallant did after all the premiers met and it's an invite after the fact or what Mr. Higgs just did on the fracking thing. You don't consult after the fact. It's got to be right at the front end, which means it's an ongoing working relationship. You put that piece in the puzzle in place and it totally changes the political model in New Brunswick. That then in turn nurtures something you can now call cooperative politics. The very thing that that cut line was accusing you of doing, of cooperating in the end. Okay, but that's how you be the change, one of your guys' tags. Overarching all of that is that you'll nurture the collective soul of the province. And that would feel really good to be able to do. Thanks. That's my pitch. Any questions?
Good. Yeah, there's, sorry. It'll sound a little trite or corny, but for me it's authentic. It starts with you. The change starts with you. So the more that you do your change, out there it reverberates and it changes a different thing. It's ca called resonance or harmony. The more your frequency is changed, the more that frequency will come to find you. I watch you all the time on Facebook. Uh-oh. <laughs> I can't get the liberals on the show. <laughs> so that was, an easy, that was an easy joke. That's a little unfair. The provincial liberals. Um, I've been chasing them for three or four years. Matt DeCourcy has been very kind, and he's been on a couple of times before he was even a, an MP. Um, if I had more resources, and it's not a pitch, like it's honest, I sit in that garage where I work, and uh, my office is in the garage, think, oh, we need to be talking about this. I can give it the space so that other people can see it. I'd love to be on the road. I'd love to go interview the mayor up in uh, Miramichi. Our mainstream media doesn't cover anything up north at all. Um, it, it drives me nuts. So there's that. There's the quarry outside Fredericton. There's a funky little restaurant in St. John called Vegolution that has their garbage down in one small bag a week. Um, you know, where Reggie's used to be in St. John. Um, I'd love to go talk to this female CEO of um, Sussex, Barber Foods, um, and what it's like in that community. There's so many pieces that we, if I just had more resources, then I could get on the road. One of my first interviews was Graydon Nicholas when he was the Lieutenant Governor of uh, New Brunswick. It gave Graydon the chance to talk about all the good things our province does but no one knows about, because our media will give you three minutes on this supper hour, or two minutes on that late night news, and you don't get to know who we are and all the good things we're doing. Squirrel moment, if I can. Um, food, I forgot to mention, when Ted Wiggins was talking um, about farming in New Brunswick, tied to health, if you spent, this is a tagline from Amanda, Amanda and Ted, you spend $13 a week on buying local produce, not $13 more, but you re just reallocate $13 a week to buying local, it has a cumulative impact of $100 million for the farmers in New Brunswick. They can't get that message out because the media will simply talk about all the disasters. But where's the solutions? That help? Had enough? Long day? Thank you again for inviting me. Hey. Oh, oh, we get to do the gift bag then. Yes. Thanks, for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Take care.